is organized into three main parts. First is with regard to parking concerns, garage enclosures, carports. Second is property maintenance and code issues, the accessory structures and patio covers, uh, fencing standards, and then some property management and rental inspection codes. Uh, then incentive and revitalization strategies, basically things that we could potentially do as the Neighborhood Preservation Committee recommended to address 
some definitions with regard to residential parking and current requirements. Current requirements are one garage space and two spaces on concrete for every home. Uh, they're, they're not permitted to be in the front or the side yard setbacks. It has to be at least five feet from the property line. What I would consider probably the biggest loophole for current carports is that uh, detached structures that are under 121 square feet don't require permits. Variances are heard by the zoning board of adjustment. There aren't any exterior finish requirements outside of Old Town, and the Old Town Design Review Committee uh, would review structures that do require permits. And by the way, what we're talking about here is obviously on site parking. Uh, one of the issues that I brought up earlier that the committee looked at, but opted not to make any recommendations on what is off site parking or, in other words, street parking. How much parking you have on the street or the complication associated with numerous cars on the street itself. I think that's maybe where you were headed. Right. They felt they could address, yes. it, address it better through, the, through restricting garage enclosures and car parts as opposed to parking on the street. Mm -hmm. Did you want to go in a different direction here? That's something we all have to discuss. Real quickly, what's the, uh, just I'm curious, what's the Required distance from a mailbox for parking on the street. You, you just can't interfere with the mail carrier uh, delivery, and typically they'll, you know, seven to ten feet either side of the of the mailbox. We don't have a city ordinance. We do. We do have a city ordinance that prohibits that. It just says prohibit the. Yeah. Okay. So, so if they have a semi going down through there, you can't park. <laughs> Pretty <the> much. <laughs> okay. So if he knows that can get quarter, you can argue. Okay. But they, they don't care if you are. They're just not going to deliver your mail. Let's see, that's it. And it could be your neighbor parking in front of your mailbox. Mm -hmm. yeah. On a public street. Yeah. Uh, FYI, the, what the community really looked at as far as street parking was permit requirements for time of day shifting from one side of the street to another, which you typically see back in the street, anything like that over here in this part of the country. Uh, I think because it has not been used much in this part of the country, they really didn't care much for either one of those. They really shied away from uh, those types of regulatory impacts on the residents. Uh, there was one <coughs> requirement that came in right about the same time that they didn't really look at, which is the Richardson ordinance that uh, requires the parking you limit your parking only to the property in front of you. In other words, you can park on the street, but only between the property lines. You can park in front of your neighbor's house or three houses down or anything like that, except during certain times of the day. It's like a, I don't remember, what was it, DJ? Seven to two or something like yes, that? Yes, seven to two, uh, but it was, it was one of those. Nine to two or something Yeah, like so, that. so you could have a, a Super Bowl party, or, or you could have a Bible study, and you could have a bunch of cars, but that, like, overnight, they weren't going to be parking there. So you wouldn't have 14 cars parked in front of your house overnight. So just that why they did not look at that type of car. But on that, don't you have to register all your cars? Or get a tag or something? There has to be some way of identifying whose cars were Where is this? associated with what property. And, and it's still a public street. Public street. Public street. Again, Richardson's been uh, using that for a couple of years. I don't know how they, what they used to do. Because the neighbors didn't complain, they wanted to do something. They probably enforce it on case by case basis when they go out and they try to find out who's going to be doing all those things. Richardson Heights area. Yeah. So what you would do is you'd go to the house that's complaining and you ask the owner, Are those your car? Your car? And he'd say, No. Boom, parking ticket. So go ahead. Uh, these are some more of the Neighborhood Preservation Committee findings. Basically, that they found that the conversion of garages was contributing to overcrowding of the streets and had led to several of the code violations. And it was particularly happening in smaller, older neighborhoods that maybe didn't have the garage space or the, the pad space to accommodate these vehicles. And so uh, last May, council actually approved an ordinance reinforcing the current code requirement that one garage space and two paved spaces were required per unit. 
basically eliminating garage enclosures without uh, requesting a variance or providing a similar another garage outside. Did so they make people tear out the garages that have been enclosed? No. So how did they get the one garage enclosed? For future changes. Future, yes. Okay. So they weren't enforcing what was already there. That's true. Everything existing was allowed to remain, but future garage enclosures were. Yes, what what we did. We've, uh, we've done a fairly good inventory of what's out there, and what's out there is very confusing. As Mr. King had said earlier, that there was a time when I came to work uh, in the mid-80s that um, they didn't allow the garage conversions because the zoning ordinance said you couldn't do it. And then there was a period of time after that that the wind changed and the, they allowed the conversions because that was past the front door, man's castle, person's castle, so they allowed them. And then they, so there was a blend, I can remember two or three different changes in, in, in the policy of it, of uh, how it was administered. So, and before the other one, they didn't regulate anyway because the building codes weren't in existence prior to 71, so in Louisville. So there was a hodgepodge of different requirements and how they enforced forced it. So that was that led to a problem as well as trying to figure out what's whose is legal and whose isn't, who had a permit, who didn't have to get a permit. So Cleve had his personnel go out inventory the city of all garages from what we could tell from the public street side or the alley side that had been converted. Although there's a, there a few, including a former employee, who kept his garage door, looked like a garage door, smelled like a garage door, but that was his billiard room inside. But he did it so he could convert it, should he sell it, and it was a nicer house. If somebody wanted a two-car garage, and it was holding up the cell, that it could be converted back to the garage. Okay, what's really famous, as he said, the wind came. What he's talking about is councils changed. So then they started I didn't changing. say that. I know you did. You were being very polite. But councils changed, and they changed their... They changed the order. So, well, now you can't do it. Now you can't do it. Now you can't do it. And what's really even closer to this is that we, we brought this up the last time, or the first time the council, what, five years ago, I guess, when we brought this up? It, it got shot down, and there were several people out there, not only one, but there were several people out there that were, oh, you can't take that away. It's already up, 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 up. So, but they didn't want, they wanted us to do something about the parking. So we put them on this committee we put those three people in the committee. They came back with the recommendation to out all the garage closures. <laughs> well, that's what we wanted to do. Well, um, about the garage doors, are we giving any permits out? Is it now policy? If they wanted to do a garage enclosure, they have to come to the council? Or variance? Yes. Okay, that's what I want. Thank you. I believe there was a recent variance for garage enclosure. Whoa! Because every time you make a hard and fast rule, then you change it. Because of the circumstances. <laughs> These are some photos of uh, some carports, actually, that, have, that are, exist around the city, and some of them are using materials which uh, staff would recommend. That's just a, a very simply brief sample. Again, like these other things, there's thousands of variations on that. Okay, so uh, are these in violation? Sir. Well, all of them. All no. Four of them. No. I would grandfather. <laughs> I would say the RV one is probably acceptable just by looking at it, but definitely the one with the torn carpet on top and the concrete or the. Uh, but is it because it's torn? And it's, it's what we would consider temporary. We may have replaced it. Yeah. There's a new tarp on that. So we just make a replacement tarp. <laughs> That's what I mean. It makes a difference. It's, it's because it's, it's torn or it's because it's a tarp. Huh. tarp. Right, can they still have the portable ones? Use your mouse. Use your mouse. Your mouse. Your mouse. Yeah, that one there. Is that one, is that one uh, allowed now? I mean, uh, allowed now? It, this is part of what we're going. That's no, part, part, of what, part of what we're presenting is that 
the, the, the typical portable ones that are sold at Cabello's or Northern Tool or whatever that don't have the concrete footings that aren't affixed to the ground, we don't have a tool to say that those are illegal because they're temporary, quote. So there's not, there's not anything out there. This is part of the, the, what we're presenting to you all of, of do you want to regulate it or not. You know, see the temporary versus the permanent. If they're permanent in the setbacks, then we have a tool to, to address that, unless they went to zoning board of adjustment and got variances, which there are a number of those throughout the city. But the temporary ones, we don't have a tool to address at this time. But we're, we're, gonna, we're presenting that now. I'm with you now. Yes, sir. Also, a lot of these wouldn't have had to have gotten a permit because they're small. They're less than 121 square feet. So under our current requirements, No, I'm, I'm not saying specifically that oh. one. I'm just saying some are small enough that they oh, would require a permit. If you look at that one, there's actually two of them. That's what I'm thinking. It's, it's probably about double that. Those are big. So okay. we're just talking carports right now, and then we're not talking about shape. No, no, this is carport section. Okay. All right. So the proposed standards for citywide carports and portable shares be that anything that's less than or equal to 100 square feet doesn't require a permit, although it still needs to be located uh, behind the building line in the front setback. The side and the rear setbacks need to be per the zoning district and five feet respectively. The maximum clearance height would be 10 feet. No requirements for roof pitch or materials, and you could use any listed material in the building code. Once you get above 101 square feet, you do have to get a permit. You're still required to be located behind the front building line. Side and the rear setbacks are the same. Maximum clearance height goes up to 14 feet. The roof pitch materials have to be consistent with or similar to the primary structure. And the materials are per the general development ordinance or they need to match what's on the primary structure. Neither, neither one of these say anything about it being permanently attached or to the ground or how it's attached to the ground. Because we would also, um, I guess the temporary definition is taken in here, but, uh, well, oh, go ahead. That comes into the permit process. Because they have to get a permit, and that's what we can look at it. Okay. And that there's no high to Anything that's temporary would be considered, you could have it for 72 hours or less, but that would be it. These are just some diagrams showing how uh, a carport with these with these standards could be located on a lot. And then for Old Town, the standards are slightly different. Uh, any size of carport or short chair would require a permit. And then the front setback would be per the zoning district, but not less than 10 feet because some of our zoning districts in Old Town don't have a front setback. Uh, the side and rear setbacks would be uh, for the zoning district and five feet respectively. Maximum clearance height of 14 feet. Roof pitch and materials matching the primary structure and uh, same for the exterior finished materials. Why would a carport in Old Town less than 100 square feet be the permit? And in the other part of the town it's not required. Just a greater level of review in Old Town. It's more of a visible area all of Old Town? Design Review District, right? Mm -hmm. These are some diagrams that show where a carport or port chair could be located in Old Town. What poem is that, though? I think it's pretty much a good point there. Why there's more of a history of complaints, and it's more. Start allowing it, I mean, if you continue to allow it all over, is it not going to be, as time goes on, to be the same problem in the other part? Yeah. Potential. See what I'm saying? Yeah, if we're saying true. because Oak Town is more, well, that's where it's happening more often, so we're restricted more there than our other parts, as time goes on, is the other parts going to be the same? But also, in addition to what you have chosen to do in Oak Town, which is again that heightened review process through the Old Town Development Review Committee, creating that special district that you want to create with that look, that you're not applying to the rest of the city. Still part of the permit. Yes. <laughs> there's still 
are some realities here that have to be dealt with as well because to require the permit citywide requires an enforcement effort that is much broader and much more time intensive and review intensive. Not so much review the plan, but people have to keep up with what's out there to a much greater degree in these, these small structures. And that's like I said, there are a lot of them out there. Most of them back up to the uh, yeah, it is. Most clean jump in here. But there, there's not a lot of 10 by 10 carports out there compared to the ones that we have complaints on or the ones that warrant truly a permit and inspection, structural integrity, or is it is it interfering with the neighbor's drainage or, or watershed. That what we're looking at there is we're saying that there's there's not many carports that are 10 by 10 or smaller. Uh, if they do have something smaller, it may not be a carport, it might be an overhang for something that's tied to the roof, more of a, uh, maybe it's a motorcycle or maybe it is a small car, but we, we certainly can, can require the permit in the city if you want to, but we felt like it was less than 100, we would, we would give that to the citizens, it wasn't big enough to be a significant problem. I think the issue with Old Town is they were looking at, since they already require permits for painting a house or there's already a different standard in the overlay district that maybe a 10 by 10 would take away from somebody who just rebuilt their house and did a great job maybe maybe that would so again we, we can we can change this if you like but we felt like this was a higher level of scrutiny in the old town we already had precedent there with the overlay district so that's why we did that and that's again how we're defining old town Right. In this case. In the, yes. It's not everything in what somebody might define as okay. Right. It's a specific it's area. Design it's right. in the design district, in the, in the limits of the design district. And I understand that. I guess I was trying to be, we're being reactive now instead of proactive. Because we're having the problem, we're trying to do something to fix the problem. What I'm concerned about is if we don't do it all over, it's called saying it's to be more enforcement, but that's what got us in this now is we didn't, it's our fault for not doing as much enforcement probably as we should have or we, I mean, we wouldn't have this problem. And we can change that. That's council so prerogative and we can, we can change we that. We want to be proactive and not allow it to happen throughout the city. How many of y'all have a, a car that could fit in a 10 by 10 space? I do. A car? Yeah, two. You got two cars that fit in a 10 by 10 Nothing out there would fit in 10 by 10. There's not many of them that will do everything like that. And I, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying so there. Right now we don't have we the, the garage in the house. The garage in the house is 20 by 10. Right. That's what I'm getting at. Right. You know, you're not going to protect much of a car at 10 by 10 shelter. And, and uh, so, you know, the, the reason that was put out there is so we don't have to deal with stuff that's under 100 square feet. And I understand that, and they're saying right now we don't have much of it, but I'm wondering no, there's, if we it's everywhere. Well, they just said it's not much. A, a carport or a shed structure? A shed structure is no, all no, over the place. We're not, we're not there. This is to tie to the house yeah. as a carport. But, we'll, we'll get to what you're but, talking but about. But do you want, yeah, now, okay, so we're going to do this on this side, but now should we? We'll get to that. Put the sheds but too. See, the whole deal is most of them are going to be screening devices or, or something else. But very few 10 by 10 car spots. Yeah, that's Otherwise, right. garages would be 10 by 20. Right. There's, very few, there's very, very few of these that are 10 by 10 carports or port and shares. There's quite a few 10 by 10 shade structures, which is another category right. we'll get to, right. or accessory building or whatever. Right. We're talking about true definition of carport, which we'll have that in the ordinance for what we can all have that. But if you want to... And I agree with you. There are very few. I just kind of want to keep it that there's very few. The danger here is going to be the a really shoddy little path, uh, tack on a, a four by ten awning over the side yard or the, the side part of a building, and then you, you know, park try to stick something under there. And it's less than 100 square feet, and this looks bad, but uh, they, they don't even do it. Yeah, if you don't burn it, at least that, the permit requires you to say it's not. Oh, you're talking about in Old Town? Anywhere. 
Well, how are you going to go after it on the other side of town if you're not requiring a permit? Well, that's what I'm saying. You could require a permit. Okay. But the, we didn't pick on Old Town. We did this in the overlay district. Right. That's all that was done. It wouldn't go. Everybody in Old Town, y'all were going to get Good. screwed on here. Right. That wasn't the deal. This was done intentionally and quite often at the neighborhood's request. Right. They wanted to stop some of the stuff that's going on. And I don't know what percentage of Old Town Design District is commercial. I don't know what percentage it is. But it isn't all houses. It, it's and I agree 100%. We did it because of this request because they didn't like what was going on. I guess one thing is we can go ahead and put it throughout that way we maybe don't have it happening in the other places later on, years from now, so that their request requested this to do it. You also got to remember in Old Town, a lot of these houses, they don't have a carport or a garage. Right. And quite often they got a gravel area on the right. side of the house to park the car. Okay, it's different though. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so we have the implementation a little bit, but there were several options that uh, that we had kind of mulled over. The first one would be to conduct an inventory, allow existing structures to remain if they're in acceptable condition, meaning they're not a safety hazard, they're not in, they're not dilapidated, and that um, we just require all new structures to comply with the standard, the new standards. The second would be to basically amortize the carports uh, by selecting a future date in which they all, by which they all must meet all the requirements. And then the third would just be prohibit all carports that don't meet the setback building line requirements. Well, option two, you're talking about the ones that even got a permit in the past? We're talking about taking the me. That's all that is. And, uh, that's we're all. Well, what you, I'm sorry, what'd you say? If, they, if this is option two, if they have a city permit, that's not what we're talking about. If they have a city permit and they, they have a city permit and they met the requirements at the time, yes. then they'd be legal. Unless they fell down or they were dilapidated, could be repaired. But that's another issue that I'm being a car. I think these were the ones which all, I think, would, I shouldn't say all, but the ones that could not be determined that I think that was what that option was, which is really not where we're leaning. But I don't know. Right. You know, I'm not going to be against anything out there that says all. Right. Because the city didn't require permits in some of these. Which is really the fourth option, which is the grandfather. Everything is out there. Right. Well, and you know, that's okay. We're going to say it's all come down. Yeah, that that was, when it wasn't even a permit required. But you're going to have the same enforcement issue when we talk about sheds. Sure. The same exact issue. What do you grandfather? What do you allow? Yeah. And it's worse than but If I put something in and I go to the city and I say, I want a permit for my this, and they go, well, you don't have to have one to do that. Right. And I spend my money and I maintain it all these years, and then I, I'm told, I've got to tear it down because I didn't get a permit. I agree with that. That's BS. That's and I agree with that. But if you look at option one, I think it gets us an Eric to tell I can tell you one he won't mind. That he won't mind saying he was Bill Bart and his mother lived there for how many years? Eric. He and his dad lived there for 50 years. 50 years or more. Plus. And they had a deal, but they didn't have the city permit. They got one and they remembered, well, she can't find it. His dad passed on his grandmother, his mother can't find it, he can't find it. City went out there and scared her to death. She thought she was going to have to tear everything down. And they said, no, because it's kept up in decent condition and you're keeping it up in structure. We understand that you're not doing this. So the staff has done a great job of going out and identifying those inventory them and identifying those facilities that are like that. I think the intent of this, once again, we got to look at the intent of what our staff is trying to do is to get rid of the unsightly, uh, un- authorized uh, facilities that we have that are in violation of the deal. We, we know that. But if, if I went in to get a permit and the city said I didn't have to have one. I, I'm not saying that. Well, but, but it says all carports. I think that's a mistake. I think what it told us. Well, may be a mistake. What it told us was those that, those that did not have a permit or were illegal or, you know, the, the intent was that they were illegal. They were built and were clearly a violation. This future date would be well out into the future. You give people a It's kind of like the What's what I'm Plenty of time. Plenty of notice that they got. Do what? Well, see, quite a few of these when it comes up this way. I'm tired full of these. These people, the properties changed three or four times, and they go, I didn't. it was here when I bought it. Right. 
Yeah. And and uh, I assume the city was out there doing their business too. Right. We were leaning. That's again the common sense approach is up here. Right. We probably know this one is that phrase right there. Acceptable conditions. A little bit. Yes. Qualitative. Staff has to make a judgment call on what's acceptable condition or not. So you can see her some black about that. Well, our building code, and you'll see the uh, neighborhood um, maintenance code that we're going to talk about in a minute, fire code. I mean, that what we're taking is the extremes, but, you know, if you have to throw some common sense into it, where there's five generations that bought the house, accessory buildings, carports are 50, 40, 50 plus years old, it's going to be a pretty rough day if you knock on their door and say you got to tear it down. So what we're talking about is, is buildings that have water damage that are leaning, you can push on, they're going to fall down. Their health, you know, and safety. health and safety backed up by our codes that we address commercial buildings or any other property. That's what we're talking and about. Stay relatively consistent. May not look too good, but if it's structurally sound, we're not talking about that. We're talking about that are we can we can define that for you. Bring some a little bit more wording about that. These were just kind of cliff notes, but what, that was our intent. Was those that were imminent hazards. Also, when you have the acceptable condition, I don't know if anybody in this room. Way, but there are people out that say, I don't like the color of that. That's unacceptable. <laughs> and there's been council members that have said that in the past. They wanted to get rid of the color that they have on their buildings. And Except I don't think that's a condition. We can bring this back, but our intent was hazardous. That's not what that says, but if, that's, if you're reading, we can bring that back and define that in our building and fire codes now that are in hazardous, imminent hazardous condition. That's what we're talking about. Um, Eric, can we talk a little bit more about this? Isn't this technically in addition to kind of like an additional possible requirement because they don't need to set back the building line in the future? Wouldn't we be, wouldn't we be doing that anyhow? Wouldn't we be prohibiting carports from encroaching on the setback of the building line in the future? I think this option was looking at our existing, our options of enforcement. Option three difference from this one. Option three was we go out, you don't have a permit or proof. I'm talking about existing carports. I'm thinking more about future carports. For future carports, we, we would prohibit the carport if it didn't have stuff in building line, wouldn't we? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Unless they got a variance. I just want to make that clear. Yeah. 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 It could get a variance. So. Yeah. If, you, if you put them in the GDL. If you go back to the provisions that the requirement, especially the rear building line, is that you already been providing provisions to five feet. That is not the building step back line. This adds another layer of requirement. Because you're, so basically, if you don't have enough room, then you, you're prohibited. So it is kind of a third option, a little more restrictive. Your, your current, normally, rear building line is 25 feet or 20 feet. Oh, there it is. Yeah. In the options, we're allowing five feet. So this basically back up this basically would prohibit carports in many of our districts. <laughs> because we just we don't have that large of lots. Going forward. Going forward, yes, going forward. Going forward. This is going not forward. existing. Not going existing. Forward. This is going forward. So it is kind of like an additional layer. Layer. I don't like that distance. I understand what you're doing, you're trying to get around it, but it's gonna be slippery slope, especially with you know, they want to fix it up and replace what they have. Don't you think about new? But I mean, they got to tear it down because it's too bad. At that point, does it become new? Or can they rebuild it as at that same location? Anytime you rebuild, it's new. See, and that's my problem with it. It's just that these folks have lived there. And on my street, we have all these sheds that are right up against the house. And if I have to move it out in the middle of the yard, that means I have to tear down a tree that I planted. But that I was going where I was going with this is to allow truly new structures out into the building setback. New carports. They weren't there before, never have been there before. If you want to allow those to go into the setback, 20 feet into the setback, basically. I just think that we need to talk about the ones that are there. And well, that's what we're, yeah, we're kind of doing both. Here we're talking about all this out, the ones that are there. Here we're talking about about some of the ones that are there and talk about future ones. Let's remember in all, all of this, the intent and purpose of all this is we look at it as for neighborhood,
revitalization. It's not, it's not to just continue with deterioration of existing property, but it's how to we come in and revitalize the neighborhoods and bring them to a higher standard, which in turn changes your demographic. Well, I don't mind putting something on the books about the temporary tent shelters. You know, those ones that have the poles and the tarp over it or whatever. If someone needs to have one temporary for doing whatever to either set up something for a party or work on a car for a week or whatever, but for having it there for six months and during the stormy weather and get blown up and stuff, that's where I have a problem with it. Again, I know that's where we're going here, but it's all a rule of thumb and how people look at stuff. I just don't like the business. activities, 
I would say that for the most part, uh, most homeowners use it for residential storage commodities, which is a good thing. You get your gasoline, your propane, your extra bottles for grills, your flammable combustible materials, and things that shouldn't be in the garage out there that people don't want to store. I think 90% of the perceived problem here is the appearance of most of them. Some of them look nice. These, these aren't in town. And we have regulated well, those. Nice. Drive around, you'll see the ones that don't look so nice. If we They're see one with an extension cord not. going to it, and we've noticed people going in and out of it, we will dock and see if they're using it as a living quarters, which you cannot do. We have the regulation to address that. Some police inspectors have already done that. We've had a few fires after the fire with someone living in there, so we've addressed a few of those in time. I'm sure we don't have all of them, because those are cat and mouse games, but that's basically the history of, of what's going on in that. So what you just said that, though, could you explain, elaborate a little bit on being able to see that and not being able to require them to do future their problem? It's a problem on enforcement. If we have an alley, a public way, or you can see it from the front street, but that's our limits of enforcement. Unless a neighbor invites us to the backyard, we can see it. But again, a lot of the activities that go on at night or on weekends, we're not there 24-7, so another enforcement challenge. Now, again, if now I'd say this is extreme because we haven't had that many, there's a lot of perceived out there where they say eight people are sleeping in an accessory building. Well, that shows pretty quick because we can, we can see that. If we get a complaint and it's not permitted as such, we can regulate that. But the problem is seeing them behind tall fences, 10 foot or 8 foot fence, a lot of these are 6 foot tall, so that's another challenge. But we have had residents that complain, want us to come in their backyard and see it, and if it's a violation, we've addressed it. Doesn't mean that, like, like weeds, doesn't grow back. And a lot of that does happen, but address it, but three months later, the problem is back. But we do have that ongoing now. If you have a seven foot tall code inspector, <laughs> we, we, we have one pretty close. If you wish, you guys start playing better. We should still. Still, still work. So the neighborhood preservation committee made several recommendations for accessory structures. Uh, first, they have to, they should be located behind the front building line. No more than two per lot. Easy to go. Easy to do going forward. Semi easy to do going forward. Real big problem. No overhangs on adjacent property. The total of your accessory structures can't exceed 500 square feet. So if you have two, you can't, can't go over that amount. And the aggregate square footage of both of all your buildings will determine the uh, exterior finish requirements. In, in there, we're back up to it. If, if on the complaints, we get complaints, those can be anonymous, correct? Yes, sir. They, so in other words, because people, I've, I've had some people come before and come on up and well, I don't want to say you don't have it. I said, you don't have to. In fact, you can do it online. You can even file a complaint online. But then also, they can, that's where a lot of people, like you said, if there is your neighbor, you can ask the city, give them city permission, come in your backyard, climb up a ladder in your backyard if you want to, let them, and let them look into the neighbor's backyard. Right? Put that word up. <laughs> well, we generally we generally don't like the, the ladder, but if they have a balcony, well, they a second floor, floor get a cat out of the tree. A, a, <laughs> a second floor, we've done that. But again, the, the anonymous floor. part, we don't release the complainant's <laughs> name. Right. Neighbors, they figure out who who did it because we park in front of their house and they, they know that. But we don't we don't release the name. But you can also do it online. We don't have like an underwear car like the police. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier, I mentioned that they were making a statement that this is the first fifth owner of this house. It was here when I bought it. <coughs> is there any recommendation from uh, the preservation board going forward that there could be something in there that when the next owner comes up uh, in possession of the property? Changes can be made as far as these sheds. New day, new season. Yeah, yeah new, we get off on a, well, when a, a house, new start. When a house sells, the city doesn't know. 
uh, that's a transparent transaction. So there's not a lot of opportunity for us there. Uh, we, that would be difficult. I don't know that how we would link with. The, the question is: uh, Is there a chance to uh, for the city to intervene if uh, homeowner A sells to homeowner B and have that be a, a trigger point for compliance? And I don't believe there is. Um, you have to have some kind of requirement that the real estate industry report to you a sale. I'm not sure how you would do that. Good luck with that. Yeah. That. <laughs> we have some recommendations. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you that's not the way it works for commercial businesses. If, if Leroy's Shoes sells to um, Tasha's Shoes, then the legal nonconforming can continue. No trigger point there on just ownership of sale in the commercial world. If nothing else has changed, we'll we'll see some recommendations here that may have helped us when we get through it. Forty, forty weeks. I have one problem with this, and it's just you know it's me sitting in my shoes looking at my my own situation for a starter. But right now I could put three outbuildings on my. I have one. I one that's twelve by twenty four. I could put two more outbuildings on it. They'd be a hundred feet apart. I could have three of them maybe 100 feet apart. The way this regulation is set up, it's not tied to the size of the lot. But at 100 feet apart, my outbuildings are further apart than the density you would have if you had two per house in a typical neighborhood. So I feel like I'm kind of getting penalized here. You'll see when we get to the NPC proposed something that relates to lot, what, your, uh, what your district is. So your, the lot coverage does come into play with some of their uh, so a person with a larger lot would be able to have essentially larger accessory structures or more accessory structures, up to 500 square feet before you get a variance. But on some of the smaller lots, especially some of the townhouse zoning, you would be probably restricted by your lot coverage based on one of the entities you recommend. Yeah, and I was going to say it works the other way too, because I don't want to see two of these on a you know, garden home backyard. Right, that's right. Where, yeah. And the other thing is that your situation is very unique. Not the norm. I know it. I know it's not the norm. So, it's, you know, this would be different if you were in a city where majority of the lots were two acre lots or you had a two lot. But so we are looking at the majority for the purpose of this ordinance. Where we know your case, a case like yours, anyone in your situation, what you're describing would be unique. That it would be you may you still have that extra layer of permit by coming to the city council, but it's a unique situation that would be permitted a different way. Okay. Versus you know, eighty percent of our Inventory out there that is. Okay. I'm just thinking about whole <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, to continue on with the recommendations, uh, they suggested that we eliminate the residential component, basically require any type of habitable structure to go through the building permit process, so it wasn't approved as an accessory structure. Mm -hmm. Remove the requirements from the zoning ordinance and put them in the. Uh, general development ordinance so that variances can be requested. For example, if someone had a large lot and wanted a, uh, an accessory structure larger than 500 square feet. Uh, or if two buildings are proposed on the same lot and the total exceeds 100 square feet, five foot separation is required from the main structure side and rear of accessory buildings. And see recommendation. Um, that recommendation. My shed's been out there, and I put it five feet away from my house, it'll be in the middle of the yard, or you have to remove a tree, and it's kind of, it's been that way for 30 years. And it's about time for it to be replaced. I'm not, I don't want to put it in there. Well, you'll see in the staff recommendations that we're coming up on, we... I'll have to replace it before you pass this. Okay. 